about mental health stuff? Are you open about? I'm open about everything. everything? I'm ready to rock and roll. Are there no go zones? No, no, no go zones. <laughs> you got your perspective. I just want to be happy. Don't you want to be happy? Now, Gary, you have this incredible gift. When you open your mouth, everyone listens. <laughs> I don't know if it's because there's a lot of swearing, but <laughs> impact. But you have that gift, and you can turn the world around in a certain way. How are you going to use that? I know you do it for business, but how else? You know, I think uh, I have a lot of ambitions with how else. You know, over the last five years especially, and really the last three, as my awareness and, and internet fame has grown, it's been very clear to me that I touch on subjects, whether it's parenting, whether it's happiness. You know, my great passion is to redefine what success looks like and turn it from something that is around money and make it around, you know, happiness and, and just feeling light. Mm. Um, and so, you know, even though that's a very daunting question, uh, I think about it the same way that I've built all my businesses, which is one day at a time, one step at a time, one piece at, we, one piece of content at a time, one interview at a time, mm. one talk at a time, uh, execution. Yeah, amazing. And patience. patience. I, think, I think one of the things that I feel very confident about is I think there's a lot of us in the world, people that are watching, mm. you, I, people behind the cameras right now, that have great ambition to leave a good impact, to do good, mm. to spread happiness. But I find a lot of people are impatient. Mm. You know, to make a huge impact on happiness in the world, that's boiling the ocean. Yeah. That shouldn't happen overnight. That yes. shouldn't happen in three seasons. So that should true. be in perpetuity. Uh, and so, patience. So what do you think underneath, like I've been watching a lot of your content and you're such a great person to speak to about business, but I want to know more about Gary V behind the business. And it feels like, have you taken a turn more towards helping individuals more so than even the business side of things? At some level, I, you know, it, three, four years ago, I was very passionate about putting out these really tactical business advices that I thought really could help people seize the opportunity that the internet is. And I kept trying to figure out why they weren't doing things. Why weren't they executing? Why weren't they putting out content? And it led me to a path of like, wait a minute, there's a level of confidence and a level of not being insecure and a level of dealing with judgment that I have, which has led me to far more strategic conversations around mindset. Uh, and so yes, I think as I've kept digging down the well, you know, the reality is, is that so much of my business advice is predicated on foundational mental strength. Uh, so you're not gonna put yourself out there if you're worried about a comment in the comment section or what your mom is gonna think. And so, yeah, I think over the last three or four years, the evolution of listening to why people weren't doing things that were very clear and working has led me down a, a, a more mental path. Mm, absolutely. So when you say, I mean, a, key, a, sorry, a big key you say is not caring what people think, how do you train someone to stop caring so much? <sighs> to me, I think a lot of this is exercise, right? By saying, Stop worrying about people's opinions. Are you gonna live your life based on somebody else's opinion? Don't worry and think back to the way you were parented. Your insecurity comes from some of the missteps of your parents, but don't overjudge them. It is what it is. It's on you, uh, accountability to get there. I think it's practice. It's just practice. You know, it's just practice. It's building a muscle. It's building a muscle. Wake up every day, get a bad comment, and, and this is why I'm so prolific in my daily content. I just want to keep talking about it and hoping that it, you know, to your point, and thank you for saying it, I was born with a gift that makes people pay attention. So if I've got them in, I'm just gonna pound them. There's not a whole lot of different things I'm gonna say over the next 70 years. There isn't much else to be said. There's very clear foundational aspects of this. So I think it's practice. Mm. And I think the 813th time that I say it, is the day some woman in Hunter Valley says, you know what, today's the day I'm gonna jump. And she makes a video and she's scared to do it. And there's some tough comments and it's a little bit easier because she's practiced building up the courage. It's no different than the kid who wants to learn how to swim or kissing a girl or or riding a bike. 
you're building yourself up, right? You're like, today's the day, today's the day. You know, and you put your toe in the water and, and you said today was gonna be day and you didn't do it and you went home and the next day you go to the pool. It's, uh, it's, it's practice. So just building that muscle. So taking you back to your childhood, I know that school was a bit of a struggle and there are so <laughs> many out there watching that could relate. What do you say to them? I mean, modern schools across the globe are not built for the realities of 2020. I agree. So it doesn't mean you need to be disrespectful. It doesn't mean that you just need to quit. Uh, please recognize if you're not a great scholar that a lot of hard work is in front of you. Mm. Um, but yes, I, I, I think that if you're a parent right now and watching this, most parents struggle with their children not doing well in school today because they worry about the judgment of other parents. So true. Which is really unfortunate. Mm. I, I look into the camera and I plead to parents of today, please don't parent your children based on other parents' opinions. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 a, it's very sad to think that parents are willing to force their kids to do things that they deeply know their kids are not about mm. because they're worried about what the neighbor's gonna say. Mm. Uh, for the kids that are watching, I say, look, you know, you need to be self-aware. You know, I know school can be a drag. Please recognize if you don't do it that you're gonna have to work hard and forever. And so, <laughs> you know, cause you're gonna be starting at a lower point. Yeah. You know, that diploma's not gonna get you in the door, so you're gonna start at the dirt. I think there's a lot of entitlement from bad students. They're like, ah, I'm a bad student, but I'm gonna be an entrepreneur. Being an entrepreneur is ridiculously hard. And so I highly recommend uh, a lot of self-awareness both on the parent and the kid level gets deployed. How do you know that you can make it as an entrepreneur? Is it you don't. Take a certain, you just gotta try. You and don't. be patient and hustle. Yeah? Yep. Is that the key? That is the key. Now look, I'm sure there's a lot of kids or grown-ups who actually feel the way I did, which was I knew. But I didn't really know. Yeah. You know, it felt natural. It felt like I had it. It seemed that every time I put my foot in the water, a lemonade stand selling some baseball cards, trying to shovel snow, that I did well. But until you do something you don't fully know, mm-hmm. I think the key right now is to make sure you're not doing it because it's cool, because everybody else is doing it. Mm-hmm. Everybody wants to start a business. Everybody's got a side hustle. Everybody's got an app idea. That is a modern day phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is a reaction to the internet itself. It's appropriate. Mm-hmm. but. Before you tell me you're gonna build the next Facebook or Uber, before you're gonna make a million bucks, why not make a hundred bucks? Why not actually put your foot in front of you? And so, you don't necessarily know, but if you love it, if you love it, if it just gets you going, the idea of buying and selling something or starting something or building a community, uh, you must scratch that itch. Mm. Because regret is probably the thing that I fear the most. And I see, to me, the saddest thing in the world is an 80 or 90 year old that I come across that is deeply grounded in regret. Mm. Cause it feels like, you know, it feels like you can't do anything about it anymore. Yeah. And, uh, and a lot of people have it. Yep. You wouldn't have any regrets so far, would you? No, cause it's too early. I'm sure I will too. Yeah. We're all human. Uh, but it's too early. Yeah. You know, the great thing about being 43, especially the way that I contextualize time, I don't even feel like I've lived half my life yet. Yeah. And so it's tough for me to regret, but actually that's not fair. I would actually tell you, it doesn't, you know it's funny, it doesn't come across as regret, but there's definitely a golly gee shucks. I wish I had a little more fun in my teenage or, tw- or in my teenage years or 20s. You know, when I talk about how hard I worked in my 20s, only the five or six people that were closest to me really actually know how true it is, how extreme it is. Mm. I really, really, really didn't take any vacation time or weekends in my 20s. And I do have a level of regret of that. Mm. A couple of weekends with the boys, a couple of trips, couldn't, could have done me some good. Mm, so driven. Now I know you come from amazing parents, an amazing background, and, and you talk a lot about children not having those same opportunities. What was it about your parents that we could pass on to other parents? My parents had two extremes. My mom was deeply optimistic and built self-confidence in me and over-loved me, and my dad, was deeply pessimistic, very much around work ethic, and, and, and saw the world differently. And in those extreme contradictions, I think I became the enigma or anomaly that I am. <laughs> now, there's also some DNA in that, meaning a lot of people from 
from both my parents. You know, my parents even joke like, you've really made us out to be these super parents <laughs> and, it, and it's because I'm focused on seeing the good. Yeah. Um, so that's how I see I think it. that's your hard wired to be optimistic I anyway. do believe that, yeah. I do believe that. But I do think it was encouraged. Mm. I, I do think that if my dad and mom switched and I grew up with a parent that was deeply pessimistic mm. from one to 14, that some of that optimism would have gone from a eight to a seven versus what I think with my mom, an eight to a 10. Mm. So I do think, you know, this has been figured out long before I came along, this nature nurture environment is very real and so yes, I think there are things deeply DNA wise about me but I do think the way I was nurtured, the environment I grew up in and the parenting I had had an impact as well. Much like I look at my sister who's only three and a half years younger than me, right? For me, by the way, I know all the noise is going on, I see everybody behind camera, I love this. So if you're watching at home, I, I love the chaos. So, um, what happens. My sister's only three and a half years younger than me and she's wired to be pessimistic. And I think she's a three who got parented and had an older brother that moved her to a six. Again, if she was raised by my grandmother, you know, who was very pessimistic, she might have been a three that became a one. Yeah, interesting. And so that's how I see it. Yeah. Where do you see yourself zero to 10 on the happiness scale? 11. (laughs) Every day? Every day. Really? I'm driven by gratitude. I'm incapable of being upset around things that don't matter and everything besides the health of nine people doesn't matter. When a parent of mine passes away, that 11 will become a zero. For a day, a month, a year, I don't know. I haven't crossed that bridge. Mm -hmm. But I have put myself in a very interesting box mentally, Mm -hmm. which is my perspective is binary. It is black and white. Either the nine or 10 or 11 people I love the most are healthy and woke up this morning and didn't die and thus I'm fully happy or not. And losing an account or having people write something bad about me or having a PR headache or something didn't work out the way I wanted or somebody stabbed me in the back or it just, it resonates for a second. Maybe it gets, I mean extremely difficult things that I that I notice contemporaries struggle with carry three minutes of of anxiousness with me, 65 seconds of inconvenience, may, if it's traumatic, maybe a couple of hours yep. before it translates into, this really doesn't matter. So it's all what you say to yourself at the time or do you practice developed over time? I probably have spent the last 15 years of my life making pretend that my mom died. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do a lot of things where something great happens or something bad happens and I make pretend and then the phone rang and my mom died. So how would I feel? Would I feel like this huge trophy I just got meant anything? No. Would I feel like this terrible thing that happened in business today was terrible? No. So yeah, I've been practicing for a very long time. That's a really amazing way to look at things. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. It really works for me. I can see how it would work, but it's not something anyone would think of. Yeah, it's something I've been thinking about putting out more in the world. Like, really just think about it. Like, just really wake up and go to sleep every night and make pretend the singular person you love the most just died in a horrific accident. I know it, no, I get it, I get it. But but look, I want to be very empathetic. People are watching this. We all know the majority of the world deals with issues. They're watching a man who just said he's an 11 on the one to 10 happiness scale that can come across very insincere. Mm. And the follow up to why I'm there is an extreme different kind of thought process that isn't talked about in contemporary times Mm. that I would like to argue is worth a debate. Whether it works for others or not, I don't know. But it is what I do. Mm. It is what I do and And if people are seeing you as being so successful, they wanna know how your brain ticks. So maybe these little things are things we haven't thought about but should be thinking about. And if they look at my success as an ability to walk around very light Mm. versus the money I've made or the followers I have, then the hack that I just gave is even more powerful. And I would argue that a lot of my business success comes from the fact that I have not had to take a lot of hours ever in 25 professional years to sit and worry about something that's happening outside the business. Amazing. I'm giving it my all, carefree, mm. and uh, 
That's so how I see it. So just flashing back to Please. when you are at school, so that what was the tricky thing that made you get the Ds and Fs? Was it, were you dyslexic, ADHD, was it anything? Probably, probably. I don't know, I wasn't diagnosed with either, but it was a different time in the 80s. It was deep self-awareness that everything that was going on in that classroom was completely irrelevant to what I was going to be. Yeah. It was either a mix of unbelievable audacity or incredible self-awareness at such a young age. You just... And probably a little bit of both. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I just remember being in fourth grade, I remember it vividly, sitting in Mr. Molnar's science class saying, I'm gonna win anyway, I don't care about Saturn. <laughs> I love that. I don't Did care you say how it to the teacher? No. Uh, yes, I was, sorry. you know, something I think a lot about actually is how bad of a student I was and how disruptive in class I was because mm. I was always a little bit of a showman in hindsight, very much a <laughs> class clown, but but unbelievably liked by my teachers for somebody who was disruptive <laughs> because I think what I the reason I wouldn't say that was it was very uncomfortable for me to be disrespectful. Mm. Interesting. So I would play, diff- you know, right? Yeah, yeah, I would understand yeah. where I could get away with things that was, were, you know, that would seem like lighthearted or. Yeah. It sounds like you can completely read people. A hundred percent. Yeah, and that is, must be a massive skill in. It is the skill. Business, yeah. It is the skill of life. Yes. If I could wish anybody anything besides health, it would be emotional intelligence. Yeah. Absolutely. Where do you see yourself 20, 30 years time? You know, I don't think in those kind of ways. You know, my intuition is a far more complete, um, stronger, uh, thoughtful version of who I am today. Um, With probably a lot more awareness. You know, I intuitively have this deep feeling that everybody on earth is gonna know who I am. Uh, absolutely. I really right. do, I really do. Uh, so, you know, probably in a very interesting place. How, like you've got the stage ready to go, what, if you could say something to the world and raise their happiness, like what do you think are the key things? I think giving more than you take is an incredible way to get. Mm. Um, I think that, uh, I think that karma is practical. I think that doing the right thing and being the bigger person in every situation is always right. Um, I think that happiness is remarkably quiet and negativity is extremely loud and so do not allow that to confuse you of how great things are. I think those things stand out to me. That's brilliant. Of loud and, and quiet. You know, I think a lot of people right now, you know, social media exposes us. It doesn't change us. And what it, in my true belief that negativity is always louder than positivity, louder, not truer. Uh, what you're seeing right now is a lot of people arguing and complaining and spitting poison on social. Yet, the 99% that are silent are actually in a good place. And back to your point, if I had the world stage, the reason I would want to push that is I would like to create a call of arms of if you're in a good place to share. Like I'm proud that this morning when I was brushing my teeth in Sydney, I literally looked at my phone. It is my framework to think that way and I tweeted a blue heart, a blue heart emoji. Why blue, I don't know. (laughs) Not necessarily my favorite color. I just saw, like, but. Just sending some love out. Actually, actually I do know. Subconsciously, I think somebody might have an attachment to a blue heart and when they just see it, that might, like, if 16 people are affected by that in a positive way and so I think we need a lot more of that. Why do we only tweet when we complain about an airline? How about when you had a lovely flight? Mm. Why can't we tweet that we had an incredible stewardess? That's so good. Why don't we do that? And, <laughs> I, think, do and I think we need to make positivity louder. Absolutely. As a collective. That's what we're on about. <laughs> Tell me, do you have any kind of spirituality or faith behind what you do? Not really, you know, it's interesting. My, my family grew up in the Soviet Union and what a lot of people don't know about communism uh, is that religion is outlawed. Really? All religion is outlawed by communism. So starting at my great grandfather level, the majority of my family never really practiced the faith of being Jewish. Uh, so we are not deeply religious. Um, 
I don't really even know, you know, there is no spiritual guide or scriptures or books I've read. I'm just deeply intuitive around my humanity and kindness and that's what I follow. Mm, so you don't necessarily believe in God? You know what's funny? I have always and still feel that if you ask me that question I would say I do. Mm-hmm. But, but I don't really think of it much more past that and I don't know if I'm checking the box because it's a thing to say. Mm. Um, I, I will say that I'm unbelievably cynical to religion in the fact that I think a lot of it underlining creates lines in the sand to hate others. Absolutely. Um, so I think the manifestation of modern man and woman of religion is something that should be questioned. I think there's a, you know, it's my great fear right now with the rise of nationalism around the world. Anything that says, we're Americans and screw everybody else. We're Australians and screw everybody else. We're women and screw everybody else. Yes. We're you know, you know, Jews or Muslims or Christians and screw, anything that does anything that says I don't like another fellow human is deeply uncomfortable to me mm-hmm. and that comes in the form of many different tribes, whether religion or country or gender. Mm. Um, yeah, so I struggle with that. How would you feel about being uh President. I would feel that if I was born in America, which is a requirement to be president of the United States, that I would run for president of the United States. Probably now, for that matter. I think I would win. I think you would win too. I think I, I, think I would win. There's something very unique and special about what you're doing. I think what, what gives me a shot is that socially and humanity-wise, I have a lot of liberal characteristics. However, business-wise and merit-wise, I have a lot of conservative. Mm -hmm. And I'm able to carry those two. And I think in America right now, unfortunately, we're pushing in opposite directions. I think you could be a winner and a sweetheart. Mm. And uh, (laughs) and, uh, that's what I'm pushing for. You've got the balance going on. Thank you. So, just gonna throw some quick questions at you. Don't overthink, not that you would. Tend not to. (laughs) It could be long-winded, but not overthinking. (laughs) So if you had three people over for a barbecue, who would you love to have there? Dead or alive? Both, either. Uh, Randy the Macho Man Savage and my two grandfathers that I never got to know. Awesome. What's your kryptonite? Uh, That's a really good question. Um, Interesting. What is my kryptonite? lost my words. Yeah, which is rare, but it's a great (laughs) question. Uh, The health of my family. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. The health of my family. What do you want your children to say about you as a dad? That he showed us how to live. Mm -hmm. He didn't tell us. Mm -hmm. Your children have a swear jar? No, but they're very aware their father swears a lot. (laughs) They should start one and they'd be well to do. They would would be awfully well off. (laughs) You've done very well to (laughs) refrain. I always know when I'm on TV. Yeah, (laughs) I love it. Um, And lastly, where's your happy place? (sighs) Within my own head. I want to be in your head just for a day. <laughs> Within my, you know, it's funny, you just asked that question and the first things I saw was head against an airplane in the shower washing my hair. I'm desperate to figure out how to over communicate whatever infrastructure I have around my mindset because I'm sure for everybody listening, that quick answer is an awfully good answer for the human race. Oh, how many people can say that? Not as many as I'd like. Yes. And that is, uh, and there's a level of guilt and that's that funny. I. Guilt drives this enormous need to communicate at scale around this issue. Wow, that's why we love what you're doing. Thank you. Because everyone's just soaking it up. Thank but you. My very last question. Please. I know you're a sports fan. Yes. Have you got an AFL, AFL team yet? I do not have a footy team. No, you do. Uh-oh. Okay. Let's uh- start with this. <laughs> okay. Long Thank cats. you. They're on top of the ladder. Very pretty. And this is a very cool cat. It is a cool cat. And um, that is this now is your fantastic. official team. Can we just Thank do you. a yes, little bit can. of that one? All right, guys. I'm sure a lot of people are going to be super upset and start hitting me up on social, but yeah. I'm in. Oh, good <laughs> so good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Have fun. Cheers. Thank you, everybody. It's a nice hat. Awesome. That's a cool hat, isn't it? Great hat. Uh, we're from Geelong, but Geelong are on top of the ladder. Are they? Yeah. That was awesome. Can we get a Sorry. <clears throat>